And how am I to face the odds of man's bedevilment and God? I, a stranger and afraid, in a world I never made. In the writings of contemporary psychologists and sociologists, one encounters these lines from A. E. Hausman's poem, more and more often today, quoted as an eloquent summation of the sense of life and psychological plight of twentieth-century man. In book after book of social commentary, one finds the same message. Modern man is overwhelmed by anxiety. Modern man suffers from an anxiety crisis. Modern man is alienated. As one sociologist puts it, Who am I? Where am I going? Do I belong? These are the crucial questions man asks himself in modern mass society. Close quote. The concept of alienation, in its original psychiatric usage, denoted the mentally ill, the severely mentally ill, often, particularly in legal context, the insane. It was the philosopher Hegel who introduced the concept of alienation, outside of its psychiatric context, to the modern world. The term alienation was taken over by Karl Marx. He applied the concept primarily to the worker. The worker's alienation was inevitable, Marx asserted, with the development of the division of labor, specialization, exchange, and private property. The worker must sell his services. Thus, said Marx, he comes to view himself as a commodity. He becomes alienated from the product of his own labor, and his work is no longer the expression of his powers, of his inner self. Since the time of Marx, the idea of alienation has been used more and more extensively by psychologists, sociologists, and philosophers, gathering to itself a wide variety of usages and meanings. Certain writers, notably those of a Freudian or Jungian orientation, declare that the complexity of modern industrial society has caused man to become over-civilized to have lost touch with the deeper roots of his being, to have become alienated from his instinctual nature. Others, notably those of an existentialist or Zen Buddhist orientation, complain that our advanced technological society compels man to live too intellectually, to be ruled by abstractions, thus alienating him from the real world which he can experience in its wholeness only via his emotions. Others, notably those of a petulant mediocrity orientation, decry specifically the alienation of the artist. They assert that, with the vanishing of the age of patron, with the artist thrown on his own resources to struggle in the marketplace, which they say is ruled by Philistines, the artist is condemned to fight a losing battle for the preservation of his spiritual integrity because he is too besieged by material temptations. Most of these writers declare that the problem of alienation and of man's search for identity is not new, but has been a source of anguish to man in every age and culture. But they insist that today, in Western civilization, above all in America, the problem has reached an unprecedented severity. It has become a crisis. What is responsible for this crisis? What has alienated man and deprived him of identity? The answer given by most writers on alienation is not always stated explicitly, but in their countless disparaging references to, quote, the dehumanizing effects of industrialism, soul-destroying commercialism, the arid rationalism of a technological culture, the vulgar materialism of the West, etc. The villain in their view of things, the destroyer whom they hold chiefly responsible, is not hard to identify. It is capitalism. This should not be startling. Since its birth, capitalism 
has been made the scapegoat responsible for almost every real or imagined evil denounced by anyone. It is true that a great many men suffer from a chronic feeling of inner emptiness, of spiritual impoverishment, the sense of lacking personal identity. It is true that a great many men feel alienated from something, even if they cannot say from what, from themselves or other men or the universe. And it is profoundly significant that capitalism should be blamed for this. Not because there was any justification for the charge, but because, by analyzing the reasons given for the accusation, one can learn a good deal about the nature and meaning of men's sense of alienation, and simultaneously about the psychological motives that give rise to hostility toward capitalism. The writers on alienation, as I have indicated, are not an intellectually homogeneous group. They differ in many areas, for example, in their view of what the problem of alienation exactly consists of, in the aspects of modern industrial society and the free market economy which they find most objectionable, in the explicitness with which they identify capitalism as the villain, and so forth. Fortunately for the purposes of this analysis, however, there is one contemporary writer who manages to combine in his books virtually all of the major errors perpetrated by commentators in this field, psychologist and sociologist Eric Fromm. Let us, therefore, consider Fromm's theory of alienation in some detail. Fromm writes, quote, Self-awareness, reason, and imagination have disrupted the harmony which characterizes animal existence. Their emergence has made man into an anomaly, into the freak of the universe, close quote. Man, Fromm explains, cannot live as an animal. He is not equipped to adapt himself automatically and unthinkingly to his environment. An animal blindly repeats the pattern of the species. Its behavior is biologically prescribed and stereotyped. It either fits in or it dies out. But it does not have to solve the problem of survival. It is not conscious of life and death as an issue. Man is and does. This is his tragedy. Quoting from, Reason, man's blessing, is also his curse. Close quote. Reason from insists, and the self-awareness which reason makes possible turns man's, quote, separate disunited existence into an unbearable prison, and man would become insane could he not liberate himself from this prison and reach out, unite himself in some form or other with men, with the world outside, close quote. All social institutions, says Fromm, all cultures, all religions, all philosophies, all progress, are motivated by man's need to escape the terrifying sense of helplessness and aloneness to which his reason condemns him. Love and love alone, Fromm tells us, with wonderful originality, can allay man's terror. Love is the only sane, and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence, Brom writes. That's a quotation. Love is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. Only through relating oneself positively to others, only through feeling care and responsibility for them, while preserving one's personal integrity, he adds, somewhat mysteriously, can man establish new ties, a new union, that will release him from alienated aloneness. Every society, says Fromm, as a system of human relationships, may be evaluated by how well it satisfies man's basic psychological needs. It may be evaluated by the standard of the possibilities of love, relatedness, and the experience of personal identity which it offers man. Capitalism, Fromm declares, has been disastrous in this regard. Far from solving the problem of man's alienation, 
it worsens it immeasurably in many respects. In liberating man from medieval regulation and authority, in breaking the chains of ecclesiastical, economic, and social tyranny, in destroying the stability of the feudal order, capitalism and individualism, thrust upon man an unprecedented freedom that was, quote, bound to create a deep feeling of insecurity, powerlessness, doubt, aloneness, and anxiety, close quote. With the collapse of medievalism and the emergence of a free market society, Fromm declares, man was compelled to assume total responsibility for his own survival. He had to produce and to trade. He had to think and to judge. He had no authority to guide him and nothing but his own ability to keep him in existence. No longer could he, by virtue of the class into which he was born, inherit his sense of personal identity. Henceforward, he had to achieve it. This posed a devastating psychological problem for man, intensifying his basic feeling of isolation and separation. Capitalism, Fromm concedes, has proven itself superlatively capable of producing goods and of raising men's material standard of living to undreamed of heights. But a sane society must have more to offer man than political freedom and material well-being, Fromm asserts. Capitalism, he says, is destructive of man's spirit. He offers several reasons for this, which are very revealing. 1. Like Marx, Fromm decries the humiliating, as he sees it, the humiliating predicament of the worker who has to sell his services. Capitalism condemns the worker to experience himself not as a man but as a commodity, as a thing to be traded. Furthermore, since he is only a tiny part of a vast production process, since, for example, he does not build an entire automobile himself, and then drive home in it, but builds only a small part of it, the total being subsequently sold to some unknown distant party, the worker feels alienated from the product of his own labor, and therefore feels alienated from his own labor as such. Unlike the artisan of the Middle Ages, says Strom, whose labor could express the, quote, full richness, close quote, of his personality. It is an elementary fact of economics that specialization and exchange, under a division of labor, make a level of productivity possible which otherwise would not be remotely attainable. In pre-capitalist centuries, when a man's economic well-being was limited by the goods he himself could produce with his own primitive tools, an unconscionable amount of labor was required to make or acquire the simplest necessities and the general standard of living was appallingly low. Human existence was a continual, exhausting struggle against imminent starvation. About half of the children born perished before the age of ten. But with the development of the wages system under capitalism, with the introduction of machinery and the opportunity for a man to sell his labor, life, to say nothing of an ever-increasing standard of material well-being, was made possible for millions who could have had no chance at survival in pre-capitalist economies. However, for Fromm and those who share his viewpoint, these considerations are doubtless too materialistic. To offer men a chance to enjoy an unprecedented material well-being is evidently to sentence them to alienation, whereas to hold them down to the stagnant level of a medieval serf or guildsman is to offer them spiritual fulfillment. 2. Fromm decries the, quote, anonymity of the social forces inherent in the structure of the capitalistic mode of production, close quote. The laws of the market, he explains, the law of supply and demand, of economic cause and effect, such laws are ominously impersonal. No single individual's wishes control them. Is it the worker who determines how much he is to be paid? No. It is not even the employer. 
It is that faceless monster, the market. It determines the wage level in some manner beyond the worker's power to grasp. As for the capitalist, his position is scarcely better. He too is helpless. Quote, the individual capitalist expands his enterprise not primarily because he wants to, but because he has to, because postponement of further expansion would mean regression. In other words, if he attempts to stagnate, he will go out of business. Under such a system, asks Fromm, how can man not feel alienated? Consider what Fromm is denouncing here. Under capitalism, the wages paid to a man for his work are determined objectively by the law of supply and demand. The market, reflecting the voluntary judgment of all those who participate in it, all those who buy and sell, produce and consume, offer or seek employment, establishes the general price level of goods and services. This is the context which men are obliged to consider in setting the prices they will ask for their work or offer for the work of others. If a man demands more than the market value of his work, he will remain unemployed. If a particular employer offers him less than the market value of his work, the man will seek, and find, employment elsewhere. The same principle applies to the capitalist who offers his goods for sale. If the prices and quality of his goods are comparable or superior to those of other men in the same field of production, he will be able to compete. If others can do better than he can, if they can offer superior goods and or lower prices, he will be obliged to improve, to grow, to equal their achievement, or else he will lose his customers. The standard determining a producer's success or failure is the objective value of his product as judged within the context of the market and of their knowledge by those to whom he offers his product. This is the only rational and just principle of exchange. But this is what Fromm considers evil. What he rebels against is objectivity. How, he demands, can a man not feel alienated in a system where his wishes are not omnipotent, where the unearned is not to be had, where growth is rewarded and stagnation is penalized? 3. As consumer in a capitalist economy, from contends, man is subject to further alienating pressures. He is overwhelmed with innumerable products among which he must choose. He is bewildered and, brain and brainwashed by the blandishments of advertisers forever urging him to buy their wares. This staggering multiplicity of possible choices is threatening to his sanity. Moreover, he is conditioned to consume for the sake of consuming, to long for an ever higher standard of living merely in order to keep the system going. With automatic washing machines, automatic cameras, and automatic can openers, modern man's relationship to nature becomes more and more remote. He is increasingly condemned to the nightmare of an artificial world. No such problem confronted the feudal serf. This much is true. Sleeping on an earthen floor, the medieval serf, to say nothing of the caveman, was much much closer to nature in one uncomfortable and unhygienic sense of the word. The above criticism of capitalism has become very fashionable among social commentators. What is remarkable is that almost invariably, as in the case of Fromm, the criticism is made by the same writers who are loudest in crying that man needs more leisure. Yet the purpose of the gadgets they condemn is specifically to liberate man's time. Thus they wish to provide man with more leisure, while damning the material means that make leisure possible. 4. The development of a complex, highly industrialized society requires an extreme degree of quantification and abstraction in men's method of thinking, observed Strong. 
and this and still another way estranges man from the world around him. He loses the ability to relate to things in, quote, their concreteness and uniqueness, close quote. One can agree with Fromm in part. An industrial technological society demands the fullest development and exercise of man's conceptual faculty, that is, of his distinctively human form of cognition. The sensory perceptual level of consciousness, the level of an animal's cognition, will not do. But it should be remembered that the capacity to abstract and conceptualize offers man, to the extent that he is rational, a means of relating to the world around him immeasurably superior to that enjoyed by any other species. It does not alienate man from nature, it makes him nature's master. An animal obeys nature blindly, man obeys her intelligently, and thereby acquires the power to command her. 5. Finally, and most alienating of all, perhaps, are the sort of relationships that exist among men under capitalism, says Fromm. Quote, what is the modern man's relationship to his fellow man? It is one between two abstractions, two living machines who use each other. There is not much love or hate to be found in human relations of our day. There is rather a superficial friendliness and a more than superficial fairness. But behind that surface is distance and indifference. The alienation between man and man results in the loss of those general and social bonds which characterize medieval as well as most other pre-capitalist societies. Close quote. Fromm is claiming that there existed in pre-capitalist societies a mutual goodwill among men, an attitude of respect and benevolent solidarity, a regard for the value of the human person that vanished with the rise of a free market society. This is worse than false. The claim is absurd historically and disgraceful morally. It is notorious that, in the Middle Ages, human relationships were characterized by mutual suspiciousness, hostility, and cruelty. Everyone regarded his neighbor as a potential threat, and nothing was held more cheaply than human life. Such invariably is the case in any society where men are ruled by brute force. In putting an end to slavery and serfdom, capitalism introduced a social benevolence that would have been impossible under earlier systems. Capitalism valued a man's life as it had never been valued before. Capitalism is the politico-economic expression of the principle that a man's life, freedom, and happiness are his by moral right. Under capitalism, men are free to choose their social bonds, meaning to choose whom they will associate with. Men are not trapped within the prison of their family, tribe, caste, class, or neighborhood. They choose whom they will value, whom they will befriend, whom they will deal with, what kind of relationships they will enter. This implies and entails man's responsibility to form independent value judgments. It implies and entails also that a man must earn the social relationships he desires. But this clearly is anathema to Fromm. Love, he has told us, is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. But, he asserts, love and capitalism are inimical. Quote, the principle underlying capitalistic society and the principle of love are incompatible. Close quote. The principle of capitalism, he says, is that of fairness ethics. The term is his, ladies and gentlemen. Fairness ethics, trade, the exchange of values without reference to force or fraud. Individuals deal with one another only on the premise of mutual self-interest. They engage only in those transactions from which they expect a profit, reward, or gain. Quote, 
It may even be said that the development of fairness ethics is the particular ethical contribution of capitalist society, close quote. But, asserts Fromm, to approach love with any concern for one's self-interest is to negate the very essence of love. To love ideally is to love unconditionally. It is to love a human being not for the fact of what he is, but for the fact that he is, which means, simply, it is to love without reference to values or standards or judgment. Again, quoting from, quote, In essence, all human beings are identical. We are all part of one. We are one. This being so, it should not make any difference whom we love. Close quote. It should not, in other words, make any difference whether the person we love is a being of stature or a total non-entity, a genius or a fool, a hero or a scoundrel. We are all part of one. Is it necessary to point out who stands to gain and who to lose by this view of love? The desire to be loved unconditionally is one of man's deepest longings, Fromm insists, whereas to be loved on the basis of merit, because one deserves it, invokes doubt and uncertainty, since merit has to be struggled for, and since such love can be withdrawn should the merit cease to exist. Quote, Furthermore, deserved love easily leaves a bitter feeling that one is not loved for oneself that one is loved only because one pleases. Quote, quote. Fromm assumes that all men by nature are so profoundly lacking in self-esteem that they crave a love which bears no relation to their actions, achievements, or character, a love not to be earned, but to be received only as a free gift. What does it mean to be loved for oneself? In reason, it can mean only to be loved for the values one has achieved in one's character and person. The highest compliment one can be paid by another human being is to be told, because of what you are, you are essential to my happiness. But this is the love that, according to Fromm, leaves one with a bitter feeling. It is the capitalistic culture, he declares, that inculcates such concepts as the deserved and the undeserved, the earned and the unearned, and thus poisons the growth of proper love. How, Fromm asks, quote, how can one act within the framework of existing society and at the same time practice love, close quote. He does not declare that love is impossible under capitalism, merely that it is exceptionally difficult. To love is to value. Love properly is the consequence and expression of admiration. Love is not alms, but a moral tribute. If love did not imply admiration, if it did not imply an acknowledgement of moral qualities that the recipient of love possessed, what meaning or significance would love have, and why would Fromm or anyone consider it desirable? Only one answer is possible, and it is not an attractive one. When love is divorced from values, then love becomes not a tribute, but a moral blank check, a promise that one will be forgiven anything, that one will not be abandoned, that one will be taken care of. This view of love is not, of course, peculiar to Fromm. It is a central component of the mystic altruist tradition. Perhaps the simplest and most eloquent answer to this view of love is one sentence of John Galt in Atlas Shrugged. Quote, a morality that professes the belief that the values of the spirit are more precious than matter, a morality that teaches you to scorn a whore who gives her body indiscriminately to all men, the same morality demands that you surrender your soul to promiscuous love for all comers. Close quote. To divorce love from values and value judgments is to confess one's longing for the unearned. 
The idealization of this longing as a proper moral goal is a constant theme running through Fromm's writings. In order that man may be enabled to conquer his feeling of aloneness and alienation, to practice love and to achieve a full sense of personal identity, a new social system must be established, Fromm declares. Private ownership of the means of production must be abolished. The profit motive must be forbidden. Industry must be decentralized. Society should be divided into self-governing industrial guilds. Factories should be owned and run by all those who work in them. Under capitalism, says Fromm, men are overwhelmed by and are the pawns of a complex industrial machine whose omnipotent forces and laws are beyond their comprehension or control. Under the decentralized, democratic system he proposes, which is some sort of blend of guild socialism and syndicalism, industrial establishments will be broken down into units whose function is within everyone's easy comprehension, with no alienating demands made on anyone's abstract capacity. Under this system, he explains, every person will be provided with his minimum subsistence whether the person wishes to work or not. This is necessary if man is to develop healthily and happily. However, to discourage parasitism, Fromm suggests that this support should not extend beyond two years. Who is to provide this support, whether they will be willing to do so, and what will happen if they are not willing, happen to them, that is, are questions Fromm does not discuss. Fromm has written of his attraction to Eastern religion, to the paradoxical logic, as Fromm terms it, terms it, of Eastern mysticism, which teaches that, quote, man can perceive reality only in contradiction, close quote. If one wishes to understand the relevance of epistemology to politics, one should observe what is gained for Fromm by that paradoxical logic which teaches that man can perceive reality only in contradictions. If that is the only means of perceiving reality, if reality can be perceived at all by that means, if the law of contradiction, in other words, is an error, an illusion, then Fromm does not have to be troubled by the conflict between his claim to be an advocate of reason and his enthusiasm for Eastern mysticism nor does he have to be troubled by the conflict between his claim to be a defender of individualism and his advocacy of political collectivism. His disdain for the law of contradiction permits him to announce that true individualism is possible only in the collectivized community, that true freedom is possible only when production is taken out of the hands of private individuals and placed under the absolute control of the group that men will cease to be objects of use by others only when they are willing to renounce personal profit and make social usefulness the goal of their lives. For the most detailed presentation of these doctrines, see Fromm's The Same Society. The quotes in today's discussion, incidentally, are from his works Escape from Freedom, Man for Himself, The Art of Loving, and The Same Society. Fromm calls his proposed system humanistic communitarian socialism. Under it, he maintains, man will achieve a new harmony with nature to replace the one he has lost. Man will enjoy the tranquility and self-fulfillment of the animals whose state Fromm finds so enviable. Eric Fromm is very representative culturally and should be recognized as such. The recurrent themes running through the literature on alienation, and indeed through today's social commentary generally, are the themes which Fromm brings into naked focus. That reason is unnatural, that a non-contradictory objective reality restricts one's individuality, that the necessity of choice is an awesome burden, that it is tragic not to be able to eat one's cake and have it too, that self-responsibility is frightening, 
that the achievement of personal identity is a social problem, that love is the omnipotent solution, and that the political implementation of this solution is socialism. The transparent absurdity or the unintelligibility of most discussions of alienation might tempt one to believe that the issue is entirely illusory, but this would be an error. Although the explanations offered for it are spurious, the problem of alienation is real. A great many men do recognize the painful emotional state which writers on alienation describe. A great many men do lack a sense of personal identity. A great many men do feel themselves to be strangers and afraid in a world they never made. But why? What is the problem of alienation? What is personal identity? Why should so many men experience the task of achieving it as a dreaded burden? And what is the significance of the attacks on capitalism in connection with this issue? These are the questions I shall now proceed to answer. The problem of alienation and the problem of personal identity are inseparable. The man who lacks a firm sense of personal identity feels alienated. The man who feels alienated lacks a firm sense of personal identity. Pain is an organism's alarm signal, warning of danger. The particular species of pain, which is the feeling of alienation, announces to man that he is existing in a psychological state improper to him, that his relationship to reality is wrong. No animal faces such questions as, what should I make of myself? What manner of life is proper to my nature? Such questions are possible only to a rational being, that is, a being whose characteristic method of cognitive functioning, of apprehending reality, is conceptual, who is not only conscious but also self-conscious, and whose power of abstraction enables him to project many alternative courses of action. Further, such questions are possible only to a being whose cognitive faculty is exercised volitionally. Thinking is not automatic. A being who is self-directing and self-regulating in thought and in action, and whose existence, therefore, entails a constant process of choice. As a living entity, man is born with specific needs and capacities. These constitute his species identity, so to speak. They constitute his human nature. How he exercises his capacities to satisfy his needs, how he deals with the facts of reality, how he chooses to function in thought and in action, constitute his personal or individual identity. His sense of himself, his implicit concept or image of the kind of person he is, including his self-esteem or lack of it, is the cumulative product of the choices he makes. This is the meaning of Ayn Rand's statement that, quote, man is a being of self-made soul, close quote. A man's I, his ego, his deepest self, is his faculty of awareness, his capacity to think. To choose to think, to identify the facts of reality, to assume the responsibility of judging what is true or false, right or wrong, is man's basic form of self-assertiveness. It is his acceptance of his own nature as a rational being, his acceptance of the responsibility of intellectual independence, his commitment to the efficacy of his own mind. The essence of selflessness is the suspension of one's consciousness. When and to the extent that a man chooses to evade the effort and responsibility of thinking, of seeking knowledge, of passing judgment, his action is one of self-abdication. To relinquish thought is to relinquish one's ego, and to pronounce oneself unfit for existence, incompetent to deal with the facts of reality. To the extent that a man chooses to think, his premises and values are acquired firsthand and they are not a mystery to him. He experiences himself as the active cause of his character, behavior, and goals. To the extent that a man attempts to live without thinking, he experiences himself as passive. His person and actions are the accidental products of forces he does not understand, of his range of the moment feelings 
and random environmental influences. When a man defaults on the responsibility of thought, he is left at the mercy of his involuntary subconscious reactions, and these will be at the mercy of the outside forces impinging upon him, at the mercy of whoever and whatever is around him. By his default, such a person turns himself into the social determinist view of man, into an empty mold waiting to be filled, into a willless robot waiting to be taken over by any environment and any conditioners. A strong sense of personal identity is the product of two things, a policy of independent thinking and, as a consequence, the possession of an integrated set of values. Since it is his values that determine a man's emotions and goals and give direction and meaning to his life, a man experiences his, his values as an extension of himself, as an integral part of his identity, as crucial to that which makes him himself. If a man holds contradictory values, these necessarily do violence to his sense of personal identity. They result in a splintered sense of self, a self broken into unintegratable fragments. To avoid this painful experience of a splintered identity, a man whose values are contradictory will commonly seek to escape knowledge of his contradictions by means of evasion, repression, rationalization, etc. Thus, to escape a problem created by the failure of thought, he suspends thinking. To escape a threat to his sense of personal identity, he suspends his ego. He suspends his self, qua thinking, judging entity. Thus he displaces his sense of self downward, so to speak, from his reason, which is the active initiating element in man, to his emotions, which are the passive, reactive element. Moved by feelings whose source he does not understand, and by contradictions whose existence he does not acknowledge, he suffers a progressive sense of self-estrangement, of self-alienation. A man's emotions are the product of his premises and values, of the thinking he has done or has failed to do. But the man who is run by his emotions, attempting to make them a substitute for rational judgment, experiences them as alien forces. It is important to observe that the experience of self-alienation and the feeling of being alienated from reality, from the world around one, proceed from the same cause, one's default on the responsibility of thinking. The suspension of proper cognitive contact with reality and the suspension of one's ego are a single act. A flight from reality is a flight from self. One of the consequences is a feeling of alienation from other men, the sense that one is not part of the human race, that one is, in effect, a freak. In betraying one's status as a human being, one makes of oneself a metaphysical outcast. One feels alone and cut off, cut off by the unreality of one's own existence, by one's desolate inner sense of spiritual impoverishment. The same failure of rationality and independence by which men rob themselves of personal identity leads them most commonly to the self-destructive policy of seeking a substitute for identity, or more precisely, seeking a second-hand identity through mindless conformity to the values of others. This is evidenced in the psychology of the person who accepts the world and its prevailing values ready-made. His is not to reason why. What is true, what others say is true. What is right, what others believe is right. How should one live as others live? This is the person whose sense of identity and personal worth is explicitly a function of his ability to satisfy the values, terms, and expectations of those omniscient and omnipresent others. It would never occur to a person of self-esteem and independent judgment that one's identity is a thing to be gained from or determined by others. To a person untouched by profound self-doubt, the wails heard today about the anguish of modern man as he confronts the question, Who am I? are incomprehensible. But in the light of the foregoing, the wailing becomes more intelligible. 
It is the cry of second-handers who no longer know which authorities to obey in a chaotic culture such as ours, and who are moaning that it is someone's duty to herd them to a sense of self, that the system must provide them with self-esteem. This is the psychological root of the modern intellectual's mystique of the Middle Ages, of the day's longing for that style of life, and of the massive evasion concerning the actual conditions of existence during that period. The Middle Ages represents the second-hander's unconfessed dream, a system in which his dread of independence and self-responsibility is proclaimed to be a virtue and made a social imperative. It is a well-known psychological fact that when men are neurotically anxious, when they suffer from feelings of dread for which they cannot account, they often attempt to make their plight more tolerable by directing their fear at some external object. They seek to persuade themselves that their fear is a rational response to the threat of germs or the possible appearance of burglars or the danger of lightning or the brain-controlling radiations of Martians. The process by which men decide that the cause of their alienation is capitalism is not dissimilar. There are reasons, however, why capitalism is the target for their projection and rationalization. The alienated man is fleeing from the responsibility of a volitional, that is, of a self-directing consciousness. The freedom to think or not to think to initiate a process of reason or to evade it is a burden he longs to escape. But since this freedom is inherent in his nature as man, there is no escape from it. Hence his guilt and anxiety when he abandons reason and sight in favor of feelings and blindness. But there is another level on which man confronts the issue of freedom, the existential or social level, and here escape is possible. Political freedom is not a metaphysical given. It has to be achieved, hence it can be rejected. The psychological root of the revolt against freedom in one's existence is the revolt against freedom in one's consciousness. The root of the revolt against self-responsibility in action is the revolt against self-direction in thought. The man who does not want to think does not want to bear responsibility for the consequences of his actions or of his own life. Today, of course, capitalism has largely been abandoned in favor of a mixed economy. That is, a mixture of freedom and statism moving steadily in the direction of increasing statism. Today, we are far closer to the ideal society of the socialist than when Marx first wrote of the workers' alienation. Yet with every advance of collectivism, the cries concerning man's alienation grow louder. The problem, we are told, is getting worse. In communist countries, when such criticisms are allowed to be voiced, some commentators are beginning to complain that the Marxist solution to the workers' alienation has failed, that man under communism is still alienated that the new harmony with nature and one's fellow men has not come. It didn't come to the medieval serf or guildsman either. Man cannot escape from his nature, and if he establishes a social system which is inimical to the requirements of his nature, a system which forbids him to function as a rational independent being, Psychological and physical disaster is the result. A free society, of course, cannot automatically guarantee the mental well-being of all its members. Freedom is not a sufficient condition to assure man's proper fulfillment, but it is a necessary condition. And capitalism, laissez-faire capitalism, is the only system which provides that condition. The problem of alienation is not metaphysical. It is not man's natural fate, never to be escaped, like some sort of original sin. It is a disease. It is not the consequence of capitalism or industrialism or bigness, and it cannot be legislated out of existence by the abolition of property rights. 
the problem of alienation pertains to how man chooses to use his own consciousness. It is the product of man's revolt against thinking, which means against reality. If a man defaults on the responsibility of seeking knowledge, choosing values, and setting goals, if this is the sphere he surrenders to the authority of others, how is he to escape the feeling that the universe is closed to him? It is closed to him by his own choice. The proper answer to the question, and how am I to face the odds of man's bedevilment and gods, I, a stranger and afraid, in a world I never made, is, why didn't you?